Hello, everybody, and welcome to the American Institute of the History of Pharmacy Festival. Uh, my name is Jeremy Green. I'm a professor of medicine and the history of medicine at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. I'm also a longtime uh, follower and beneficiary from the American Institute of History of Pharmacy. It's a great pleasure for me to take part in the festival today. I also want to wish you a happy International Pharmacist Day. This is a well-timed day to be thinking about the history of pharmacy. And it's a particular pleasure for me to introduce today's uh, session, uh, which is uh, being uh, the, the talk by uh, Dr. Twain Peters, Professor of History of Pharmacy and Allied Sciences in both the Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences at the Freudenthal Institute and also acting head of the Freudenthal Institute and senior fellow of the Descartes Institute of History and Philosophy of Science and the Human Sciences and the Humanities. And I've had the good fortune of knowing um, Toyn for nearly 20 years at this point, um, uh, meeting early on at one of the first small conferences I got to go to as I was beginning my um, own career as a historian of, of pharmaceuticals, and have uh, early on recognized that both of us shared this problem of having to simultaneously describe our work to historians of science, technology, and medicine, and also to departments of pharmacoepidemiology, which were translating the broader social sciences and biological sciences of pharmaceutical use to clinical and policy audiences. And I have always looked to Toyn as an exemplar in this odd um, dual life. He's published extensively on the history of pharmacy and allied sciences, medical humanities, digital humanities, and pharmacology has more than 70 peer-reviewed publications across various genres and policy and, and uh, publication types, reaching clinical audiences, audiences of academic historians, uh, policy audiences, and public health and general readers. And his interests include pharmaceutical policy analysis, drug and addiction research, neuropharmacology and mental health, leprosy, and the reuse of heritage resources. And he, his work is necessarily interdisciplinary and complex. Um, and has become particularly engaged in recent years with the fields of digital humanities projects, aiming at connecting and integrating disparate data sources through linked data approaches to recontextualize uh, pre-modern drug trajectories. And so it is particular, I, I, with great anticipation, I look forward to his presentation today titled Formula Magistralis and the Battle Between David and Goliath, the Dutch Pharmacist versus the international pharmaceutical industry, 1865 to 2020. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Toyn Peters. And here we'll insert- Thank you, things. Jeremy. Uh, likewise, I really enjoy that you are chairing the session. Um, I will share my PowerPoint. Okay. Um, what I will do is, um, yeah, um, I have five uh, points um, I'm going to talk about. Uh, first, introducing the problem um, and uh, talking about the current situation of affordability and accessibility of medicines. Then I uh, you could say uh, back to the roots of the pharmaceutical industry in a revolution in pharmacy in the 19th century. Uh, from there, I move uh, to the heydays of Dutch compounding pharmacy in the 1950s and 60s. Then after that, the demise of Dutch formula magistralis practice. And of course, back to the future, again, the revival of compounding pharmacy. Um, this is just to, uh, as an introduction about the affordability, the cost issue, because um, uh, as you all know, uh, pharmaceuticals are always in the media uh, when it comes to pricing issues. And it's fascinating that healthcare costs um, amount to uh, 12, 30% of the BBP uh, in uh, various countries uh, across the globe. And drug costs only amount to 10 percent and uh, yet drug costs are always in the front lines uh, of the media and um it's quite fascinating to see two problems in the uh, pharmaceutical cost house so to speak so we have in the attic the high price high pricing issues and uh, in the bottom in the cellar of the house um uh, you have construction problems because of the low-cost generics 
um, that are so low in cost that producers are not willing to produce them. And we uh, face a, a number of drug shortages. Uh, so affordability, both in the low cost area of the pharmaceutics and in the high price area. And that's quite fascinating because then, um, and I will go into that uh, later when we talk about back to the future and the compounding uh, pharmacy that's coming into the picture again. Uh, if we compare um, uh, the American with the Dutch situation, as, as far as generics and branded drugs are concerned, uh, we see that, uh, for instance, in, the, uh, in America, um, almost all drugs are being prescribed are um, generics, yet if you look at the spending on uh, only 23% of its spend on generics on the of the budget in the Netherlands it's likewise so um generics account for 69 percent of the DDDs so the volume of prescribed drugs and only 60 percent spending on generics um so that makes for this uh, shortage problem and also the tensions on the pharmaceutical market um and the uh, drug shortages are globally. So uh, America has this problem, the Netherlands, and all the other European countries. Um, and it's quite interesting to see when the uh, pricing issues begin to start. Um, of course, we had expensive drugs in the 1990s, and um, uh, but um, the real price hike uh, began to start uh, after uh, the start of the 21st century. I will come to this. Um, and one of the drivers of the price, uh, in my opinion, and I've published a, an article on this uh, in 2017 in Pulse One, uh, that the quality is one of the factors uh, driving up prices. And if you look at the, uh, the figure here, and you see uh, from the 21st century onwards, we see really this price hike. And um, here is the my uh, million dollar pill. And it's not fiction anymore because we are already facing or um, we are really dealing with um, drugs amounting to $300,000 a year. Um, the Dutch high pricing categories in 2018, and you can see, and I, I don't think it's different from the American situation, oncolytics, biologicals, and uh, you have the metabolic um, disorders. Now, I'm going to present two cases, recent cases in the Netherlands, where um, uh, because of the pricing issues and the um, accessibility, because insurers were no longer prepared to pay for the high prices, we got, uh, we really witnessed fights between compounding pharmacies, either within the hospital pharmacy or within the community pharmacy. In this first case, the CDCA case, uh, in April 2018, Lydian Biosciences increased the price of CDCA from 30,000 to 170,000. Uh, euros uh, per patient per year for the treatment of the rare hereditary metabolic disorder CTX. On the left uh, hand side, you see the photograph of the Amsterdam Medical Center and the compounding area here uh, with uh, the capsules that I have been producing uh, in uh, the course of 2018 and Lydian's. Um, patented product on the uh, right hand side. Uh, so the both um, parties uh, got into a, a legal fight. And uh, it's interesting to see because um, when we are uh, going into a legal fight, it comes up to laws. And the law in the Netherlands says, and also European law, if you prepare uh, or you prescribe on an individual basis. So an individual recipe is uh, the uh, pharmacist is allowed to compound the uh, medication. 
Um, regardless whether it's a patented or non-patented drug, if uh, there is an accessibility problem, the doctor is allowed to make it available on an individual recipe. And um, in the second case, because this was a hospital pharmacy against a uh, big pharma, um, the Ocambi case, so in the US-based Vertex Pharmaceuticals, and I can imagine you all know the Vertex story uh, because uh, Barry Worth has uh, published uh, his uh, two books on this a billion dollar uh, company, startup company. Um, and it launched a series of promising cystic fibrosis drugs from 2012 onwards. And uh, they started with uh, Ivacaftor, Calideco, followed by a combination, Lumacaftor, Ivacaftor, the Okambi, and uh, more recently, the triplet regimen, the Trikafta. And it really, we are talking about uh, therapeutically um, innovative drugs. So they are making a difference in the um, in everyday practice. But um, at a cost, um, that's quite considerable. Uh, I mean, 300,000 per patient per year for a Trikafta or Combi is less um, expensive, but amounts also to 100,000. Um, and, and, and this is uh, for some people, and especially uh, the person you see here, Paul Labing, has always been very engaged with cost issues in Dutch pharmacy. And he is a compounding pharmacist, has a lot of expertise, and has a GMP unit in his local community pharmacy. Uh, you see him, sh uh, it's, it's shoulder in sh on shoulder with the minister of Health of the Netherlands, <clears throat> uh, who resigned uh, this year because of the corona um, issues. Uh, but he was very much um, on a line with, on a par, you could say, with Paul Lebing fighting the international pharmaceutical industry uh, to uh, get them um, uh, into negotiations, uh, price negotiations. It never came uh, that, uh, in the end to Paul producing the um, uh, Formula Magistralis version of Orkambi uh, because the negoti negotiations between the minister and Vertex were successful in the end. Um, I now invite you to go with me in the time machine to the 19th century. And uh, of, co of course, we see here, uh, it's uh, this autumn, it's a 200 year celebration of the isolation of quinine with um, uh, the two French uh, uh, Pelletier Caventou uh, being uh, portrayed. Uh, and uh, of course, we are now at the 19th century in the alkaloid age. Uh, French and German pharmacists were instrumental in bringing this new research field of alkaloid chemistry to fruition. And both in France and, and Germany, but also in other countries like the Netherlands, we got these small pharmacies that grew into um, uh, factories. Um, and you can see below the Merck factory in Germany. Uh, producing all these kind of series of alkaloids of high purity that were uh, sold to pharmacists that could uh, then um, use these uh, pure alkaloids for making um, medicines. Um, at the same time, we also see the dye industry uh, moving into pharmaceuticals and one of the most um, I would say notorious examples uh, of this is Bayer, and uh, at the end of the 19th century, introducing a series of new drugs, among which heroin and aspirin, and are very uh, uh, we all know about. And um, you see here the uh, the car with the aspirin advertisement. Uh, you could say Bayer innovated the advertisement of pharmaceuticals in a major way and also the screening of uh, chemicals 
Um, so by the end of the uh, 19th century, uh, the packaged medicines industry really became a serious competitor to the pharmacist. And um, um, the consumers liked the packages uh, medicines and became uh, uh, regarded as a threat not only to the pharmaceutical profession, but also to the, to the medical profession uh, who didn't like the fact that these drugs were uh, advertised directly to consumers without interference or um, uh, in, in a way controlled by uh, medical professionals, pharmaceutical professionals. According to the Groningen University professor Johan Frederick Eichmann, large industry had almost completely taken off the hands of pharmacies the preparation of magistral medicines. So there was a crisis in uh, the, uh, the pharmacy country, uh, pharmacists uh, not knowing what to do, how to compete against these big companies. And uh, but there were um, because of the pressure and not only felt by pharmacy but also by doctors they uh, started an alliance together with the uh, insurance funds and um, so Dutch pharmacists presented the self-preparation of medicines uh, linked to the individual prescription as a therapeutic and economically competitive alternative and you see here below you see the a specialty drug Veronal, one of the barbiturates, and for Dutch pharmacists, immediately they started um, offering the uh, formula magistralis on uh, individual recipe, uh, barbitali, um, and so they could combine in the uh, pharmacy. And more important was that the uh, Dutch medical pharmacy schools continued to integrate literally the Materia Medica and the form Formula Magistralis in their training programs. So doctors learned how to prescribe these um, uh, magistral uh, formulas uh, and, the, uh, and knew how to prescribe them in a way that the pharmacists could compound it. Um, Again, going uh, into the Utrecht time machine uh, and to the 1950s, early 1960s, the heyday of Dutch compounding pharmacy with uh, all kinds of instruments being offered by um, companies um, to compounding pharmacies to, um, uh, in a way, speed up the production uh, process uh, and uh, one of the things uh, that um, happened in this very period when uh, you could say the golden days of uh, pharmaceutical innovation is that um, quite a number of big pharmaceutical companies in uh, France, Germany, England, but uh, in this case uh, in France, Rana Poulenc, uh, came uh, on the market, introduced in the market the a new uh, psychotropic drug, um, psychoactive drug, uh, Larjac Till, that started a revolution in the treatment of psych psychiatry patients in the early 1950s. So, um, and the moment it was introduced on the market in 1954, uh, the um, a couple of pharmacists starting to uh, produce uh, the uh, I start to copycat these uh, this new patented drug and um, we see here a photograph of a Dutch uh, compounding pharmacy in the uh, 1950s uh, late 1950s early 1960s and funny enough you see here on the photograph still this uh, I would say pre-modern um, instrument to produce the pilulule, the the um, old pills, so not tablets, pills, still being produced within the Dutch pharmacy. Uh, but um, in the 60s, um, so many new innovative drugs were introduced by the um, international pharmaceutical uh, industry uh, that uh, the uh, pharmacists could not keep up with. And um, there were spies sent out 
um, the uh, pharmacists who were famous for copycatting were taken to uh, on trial. And so over time, the pressure grew uh, to dispense um, in a new way, also in the Netherlands. Um, and quite uh, in this same period, you see also the transatlantic shift in pharmaceutical innovation from Europe to Europe to America, and uh, very much exemplified by uh, George Murk with his time appearance. And funny enough, if you read the text, it's a very famous text, of course, it's still this public uh, image of the pharmaceutical industry doing the good thing. Um, one other moment of uh, reconciliation also um, uh, of uh, yet more pressure on the Dutch pharmacists uh, to uh, improve uh, the production of uh, this formula magistralis production is the telidomide uh, tragedy and the imperative of regulation following from that. So uh, things as the GMP rules, the good manufacturing practice uh, rules uh, that make it more difficult for pharmacists in the Netherlands to keep up with uh, the uh, high quality standards, production standards. Um, the combination also, uh, the introduction of the minimum wage, um, uh, the introduction of the series of innovative specialty drugs, targeted price competition by the pharmaceutical industry, and you see the dramatic decrease in the percentage of in-house magistral preparations from 50% in 1960, uh, 60% in 1975, 10% in 1919, 5.5% in 2000s. And the dermatology, uh, dermatological preparations are and were prominently present in this group of compound medicines. Um, and what we see in the late 90s, uh, because of a new transoceanic, so we had the first shift, the uh, transatlantic shift in production and development of pharmaceuticals in the 1990s, we see the transoceanic shift where India and China becoming important in the production of chemicals, etc. Um, and the revival of the compounding pharmacies who were able to buy the um, raw materials at a extremely low cost in China, India. And it became interesting again uh, to uh, compound uh, medicines. Um, in, the night, in the first decade of the 21st century, we also see uh, that this complex system of production and distribution of pharmaceuticals from uh, the factories up to uh, uh, the patients uh, through the wholesaler, a pharmacy, hospital pharmacist, um, is uh, we see it becoming more volatile because of this transoceanic uh, shift. And uh, not only that, but also because of this uh, problem pricing uh, issues I referred earlier in the beginning of my talk. So we have the problem uh, of uh, the uh, low cost generics because of all kinds of insurance regulatory uh, measures taken by governments, um, not willing to pay so much for the pharmaceuticals bill. But on the same time, we see the rise of the specialty drug prices. And um, both problems, what I uh, started my talk with, um, the, cost, the pharmaceutical cost house, so the high price drugs, accessibility and affordability, and at the same time, the accessibility of the uh, low-cost drugs uh, that um, uh, fueled uh, a series of drug shortages. Um, case, I, I, I would say uh, the compounding firms, um, it, it's quite interesting to see also in the compounding uh, landscape, we have big versus small. So in the Netherlands, you have the Fagron, uh, it's a one billion uh, company, 
um, a dollar company. And on the other hand, you have uh, pharmacists like Paul Lebing, I refer to, but also Paul Harder. And, um, and Paul Harder is as vigilant, you could say, as Paul Lebing is, and going to, on trial, um, it's literally compounding at the bar um, uh, and uh, producing, in his case, sustained release preparations of methylphenidate. So uh, getting into fight with the uh, generic and also uh, the um, producer of Ritalin. Um, and, and the funny thing is that at the bar, in case one, so the hospital pharmacy CDCA case, um, the Ocombi case, and in this case, uh, the methylphenidate slow release, um, the pharmacist in the end won all the trials. So, uh, and that's that's quite an issue because the pharmaceutical industry, uh, it's interesting, um, regards uh, the Netherlands as a problematic area. Um, Toyin, I wanted to just break in for a moment and let you know we're at five minutes to the hour. So just in terms of a time check, if you want, there's some great questions happening in the chat if you want to have time yeah. for them. We can go a little bit over, but I just want to let sure you know. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm almost done. So... It's interesting to see because uh, the uh, the office of the EMA moved from London to Amsterdam in a country where we have these issues uh, of uh, David fighting Goliath. Uh, we have a number of, uh, of Davids, you see, um, uh, and uh, they are rather successful at the bar. And that's that's something to consider. Uh, I think uh, it's interesting, but it's even more interesting to see also this new trend uh, of compounding pharmacies, both the big ones uh, versus the small ones. Um, this is the case three uh, I refer to. Um, so um, that's about the uh, Paul Harder here standing in front of his uh compounding machinery and um producing this pharmacy slow release methylphenidate and um the conclusion um in the dynamic interplay of science medicine industry and society within the dutch context and i'm glad to hear other uh, contexts about um uh, and especially about the compounding in other countries we have seen in this paper historical continuities in the alliances on the medical market. Uh, throughout the period discussed, Dutch pharmacists, doctors, and insurance companies have shown strong interest in the accessibility and affordability of medicines. The moment uh, the accessibility and affordability came under pressure, uh, the Dutch pharmacists, doctors, and insurance companies uh, started alliances. So, and that happened in the early part of the 20th century, and again in the, at the end of the second decade of the 21st century, so quite recently. And it's, um, uh, of course, as an historian, I know you should be very careful in uh, looking at the almost present, uh, and it's interesting to see what future historians will do for with this. At first sight, uh, Goliath uh, seemed to have disciplined and subjected the Dutch David. Um, the balance of force was reversed, but to the dismay of the pharmaceutical industry, the global therapeutic drug accessibility crisis, which they paradoxically helped to create, could not be overcome by strenuous, strenuous lobbying efforts in The Hague and Brussels. Because as we all know, a lot of money goes into lobbying efforts by the pharmaceutical industry, not only in The Hague and Brussels, but also in Washington. Thank you for your attention, and I'm glad to answer questions. Thanks so much, Toyn. I, I actually have a bunch of questions. It's, a, it's an on-point uh, presentation for a lot of things I'm fascinated by today, but I want to defer to the chat, and I, I think there's a question from David Hertzberg and then a question from Arthur Demerick, and Luke tells me we have a few minutes to get to them. Yeah, I have to. David, are you able to unmute and ask your question? 
Sorry. Yes. Uh, let's see. I was just curious about the mechanics of compounding in the era of pre-made medicines. You know, if you wanted to make your own virinol, how did they? Who did they buy bulk products from? Um, did they buy virinol and mix it with another ingredient to make it technically a compounded? Or if they were, why would a company sell them materials that would allow them to do an end run around the patent? Just a, just a practical. Issue. Yeah. Um, um, of course, uh, after World War One, um, certainly um, and the um, or uh, also in the interwar uh, years, the patent issue was a kind of disputed area uh, because of the German loss in the uh, First World War. Um, but uh, the they bought the um, uh, Babitali uh, chemical uh, material from uh, directly from uh, chemical companies. In the same way we they do now uh, when they buy the APs in uh, uh, China India. Is that an answer to your question? Yes, thank you. Uh, Jeremy Green had to run off to another event he's scheduled for, so I'll handle the rest of the question and answers. Uh, we have a question joined from Arthur Damerick, as Jeremy mentioned in the chat. Uh, he writes, this feels like a real public policy trap. National health systems want to push prices down, of course, so they advocate for generics. But with quality controls on manufacturing, he writes, it isn't so easy to set up many competing firms, and perhaps the economics push toward a single supplier anyway, so then a natural monopoly, he writes, emerges. The pharmacists and doctors, he contends, aren't going to be able to solve this as they did in the 19th century. So even if Vertex gives in on price for the Netherlands, uh, presumably figuring it can get to higher get higher prices from other countries like the U.S., it doesn't help with shortages. He's just wondering uh, what would a deregulation of pharma without weakening safety and efficacy controls look like? Uh, this is a rather complex uh, question. Uh, uh, that they, I can't give a kind of you know straightforward answer. Oh yes, no um, um, uh, deregulation. Uh, I don't think de deregulation is the answer to this. Um, it's it's more. Um, I'm really glad that the um, the laws, the existing laws in the Netherlands and in Europe, make it possible uh, to meet individual uh, medication needs in cases where the affordability and the accessibility uh, is critical. Um, so uh, is uh, it uh, a solution to everything? Of course not, uh, because uh, it's it only if we are talking about low volumes. And um, the, the funny thing is that the uh, price price lowering activities of health insurers around the globe have created this new problem of drug shortages because it's economically not longer uh, attractive to uh, invest in factories uh, producing generics for certain products. For others, it is, it still is. And you get new monopolies and um, uh, and the, and that's interesting because that's um, uh, the laws of economics. So um, generics becoming more expensive, and we see it. Uh, uh, the trend in generics is quite uh, remarkable uh, as far as pricing is concerned. The, the last ten years. Uh, I got another question from uh, Luke Rickard. He said it's a great talk. Uh, thanks you for participating in the, in the festival this morning, Toyn. Uh, he says, wondering about how the Dutch pharmacist's professional identity changes in relation to the ebbs and flows of in-house compounding. Yeah, the um, uh, let's say compounding um, has not been part of the um, identity of the um, average uh, Dutch pharmacist for two decades, mm -hmm. almost. Um, and whether it will become part of the identity, we still don't know yet. There are some uh, vigilante, uh, like uh, the two poles I refer to, uh, but in general, most uh, pharmacists um, are not willing yet to invest heavily in compounding um, uh, inventory, etc. So it's uh, the Dutch pharmacist 
is uh, presents himself or herself as an expert in pharmacotherapeutic advice and dispensing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, we're about five minutes over now. Uh, we seem to run out of questions in the chat. Uh, I want to thank you, Tony, for participating in the festival. Really interesting stuff, obviously really important, uh, really relevant stuff to uh, what's going on in the world today in terms of drug prices and drug regulation. Just want to remind everyone that their next, our next panel of the festival starts in about a half an hour, about 25 minutes now, actually. It's panel three, decolonizing drugs from the South with some very interesting topics. And of course, as always, all links to all festival events are available on the festival program. Uh, so thanks, thanks, again, thanks a lot, Tony, for your presentation. Uh, we really appreciated hearing your talk this morning.